You are listening to One Nation Under Crime, a historical chronological true crime podcast. Each week, we go through our nation's history and discuss one case from each year starting in 1800. I'm Kayla. And I'm Leah. That was a big sigh. We are to the day. Or the day. Of episode 42. Whoop, whoop. That's how old We've I made am. It. We made it. We're as old as me. Yay! <laughs> So we are we are officially to episode forty two, which is exciting and funny enough. Funny enough, there is something that refers to forty <gasps> in our case. What is it? You'll see. Yeah. But when I tell you the sources, you're gonna know what this week's case is referring to. Okay, I'm ready. Hit me. We'll say referring to. I guess. Hmm. Yeah, I'm curious. You should be, honestly. Um, so, our sources for this week. First up, theirishmob.com. Well, now. Bowery Boys History. Okay. And. I sense a theme. Gangs, an annotated blog. Huh. Well. So, you can kind of see where this is going. Mm, gangs of New York, maybe? We shall see. Mm. We are in 1839 for this week. Not quite to 1840s yet, but we're getting there. Almost. We're getting there. On the cusp. Right on it. So our events in 1839 for this week, January 2nd. This is in France, but there's a reason that I included it. And we will see. There's always a method to your madness. Uh, there always is. There's got to be. There's somehow. lots of madness. So there, there should be a method. Exactly. There's got to be. <laughs> so on January 2nd, the first photo of the moon was taken by a French photographer named Louis Jacques Duguer. Nope. Duguer, which established really? the daguerreotype photo process. And it was the most common photographic process in the world for the next 20 years. Did he capture any of the beavers? Unknown. (sighs) I could not find anything about the beavers. Okay. It's unfortunate, but... It really is. I was hoping. It, it, you know, they might have gone underground. Into hiding. Into hiding. So, on January 12th, Anthracite coal was used for the first time to smelt iron in Pennsylvania. And uh, they used Pennsylvania charcoal instead of plain anthracite. It, anyways, it, anyways. I'll take your word for so, it. So <laughs> anthracite has a higher quality compared to charcoal. So they took anthracite coal instead of just doing charcoal. Um, Because anthracite has a higher quality compared to charcoal, uh, which actually makes it harder and it produces more energy when it's burned. Okay. Um, It also does not ignite easily and it has less impurities, um, which this is all, this is important because this sparked the industrial revolution in North America and Europe. Huh. Because it made what they were using more durable gotcha. than what they had before. On February 11th, the University of Missouri was established in Columbia, Missouri. Big surprise that it was in Missouri. <laughs> but it made it the first public university west of the Mississippi River. Ah. February 12th, the Aristook War occurred which was a boundary dispute between Maine and New Brunswick. Aristook means beautiful river. But this war had a more humorous name. Oh, dear. The Pork and Beans War. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. Sounds Mm -hmm. like a smelly war. It's either because of the lumberman's diet Or because that was the regular ration given to British soldiers. Um, 
That it was a root and toot and time. <laughs> it must have been because it's also known as a bloodless war. Oh, my. And apparently some super funny things happened from what I looked into. We're probably going to do a USBS on it because oh, some no. funny antics ensued. It oh, my. was a time. <laughs> it was a time. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we're probably going to get into that in USBS. Um, so that, that is exciting. Also for any of our patrons out there, hi patrons, Hi. they just got a new episode. So <gasps> if you want to be part of their group, you can go and you can do that too. Speaking of USBS while we're on that topic, they're the cool kids in the room. They are. And, uh, I will say that the USBS is quite interesting. Um, always is always. So. Then on February 18th, the Detroit Boat Club was formed, and it still exists. Hmm. On February 20th, Congress prohibited dueling in Washington, D.C. Just, was just it, Washington, D.C. But D. it was still legal in New Jersey because everything, everything is, is legal, legal in New, New Jersey. Jersey. Yes. February 24th. The steam shovel was patented by William Otis in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Steam shovel? Yes, hmm. for trains. You know how they have like the shovels are there? Yeah. Yeah. So it, gotcha. was, it was patented. Gotcha. Probably better than using your hands, <laughs> I'm assuming. February 25th, Seminole natives and black allies were shipped oh. from Tampa Bay, Florida. To the western portion of the United States. Because oh. why not? Right? Oh. Okay. Got it. Oh. That was, yep. Yeah. March 5th, Longwood University was founded in Farmville, Virginia. There's really a place called Farmville? Mm -hmm. Farmville, Virginia. Interesting. March 7th, Baltimore City College was established in Baltimore, Maryland, and it became the third public high school in the United States. Hmm. March 23rd, I found this amazing. Okay, amaze me. The first recorded use of the phrase, okay, <laughs> occurred in the Boston Morning Post. Okay stands for OLL, O L L, correct. K-O-R-R-E-C-T, which means all right. And it was a, like, in, it was like a weird, it's a funny way of like when you say bass backwards, uh -huh. it was a funny way for them to make fun of the phrase all correct. And they would say all correct uh -huh. is like a funny way to say it. And that's where the phrase okay came from. That's kind of funny. So okay means all correct. Well, there you go. So now we know. Now you know. You uh, you got some. Uh, you got a fun fact for the day. We have been enlightened. It's always it's always a fun time. June seventh, the Hawaiian Declaration of Rights was signed. June seventeenth, the King of Hawaii issued the Edict of Toleration, which gave Roman Catholics freedom to worship in the Hawaiian Islands. The Hawaiian Catholic Church and the Cathedral of Our Lady of Peace was later established as well, which was very interesting because this was also still during a time where um, Roman Catholicism was um, very pre prejudiced against, I guess is the mm -hmm. best way to say it. They were... Um, they were very looked down upon for being Catholic. Right. Um, so this was still during that time. So it was very interesting that they gave that, you know, in Hawaii, which is not even, <laughs> it's a bit away. Right. Um, so July 3rd, the first normal state school <laughs> was opened in the United States. What exactly does that mean? You know, it would have been nice to know. Um, normal state school. I mean, were the other ones abnormal? I guess so. But Lexington, Massachusetts is where that opened. It began with three students. Not a very large school. That's not normal. You know. I, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. It is what it is. August 8th, the Beta Theta Pi fraternity was founded in Oxford, Ohio. 
There you go. September 6th, the Great Fire occurred in New York. It was one of three fires which occurred in the middle of an economic boom which covered 17 city blocks. Ooh. It killed two people and destroyed hundreds of buildings with an estimated $20 million in property damage then. I am amazed that only two people lost their lives. That is the equivalent of $544 million today. I mean, that is a but lot yes, of money. But yes, two people. But I am amazed and thankful Yes, that only two people lost their lives because, I mean, with that amount of damage and, I mean, just... 17 city blocks. I mean, wow. That's a lot. It, right? I mean, when you really think about it. Because we've both been lost? to New York. Yeah. So, which, I mean, it obviously was not what it is now. Well, but sure. Still, but still, you had a lot of... I mean, for it to be actual city blocks. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a lot. Um, that is amazing. It, it is amazing. So, I... Yeah. That's a lot of money, too. Ugh. $544 million. This week and next week, we're going to get into some numbers of some of events. Numbers? Uh, well, uh. not bad numbers in, in the fact that you have to do math. But You're going to give me nightmares. We're getting into numbers that are astonishing, like shocking large numbers related to events. And so... But I don't have to math. No. Okay, good. So then coincidentally or not coincidentally not sure september 29th the great fire of mobile alabama occurred i've been there me too um the date is a little bit of a misnomer because it was actually four large fires that mm. occurred between september 29th and october 9th the Republican complier of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, reported, quote, a very destructive fire occurred at Mobile on the night of the 7th, which destroyed about 500 houses, amounting in value to about half a million dollars. We are also informed that on the night of the 8th, another fire occurred at the same place, which destroyed a number of other valuable buildings. There's so many beautiful houses. And um, by the way, if you are going to Mobile and you use any sort of GPS that speaks to you, it will say mobile. Mobile. <laughs> mobile. mobile. She says Montgomery. I know. <laughs> she is Montgomery. <laughs> Every time it gets me because they go <laughs> and veer west towards Montgomery. Yeah. I'm like, no, 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 that's not right. It's it's Montgomery, like Montgomery, Montgomery. <laughs> you gotta like you gotta get you gotta mobile. get a little Cajun and a little Southern in there yep. to say it correctly. But it is Mobile, so yeah, Mobile. Yes. Yep. It. Yes. She really needs to get it together as mm. far as how to say things. I I, I don't you need to have a it. Southern a Southern scenery. <laughs> you know, I, I will be happy to take to record for that. <laughs> I think I'd be great at it. <laughs> I don't know. My boyfriend sometimes cusses Siri out. So, I mean, it. I wouldn't know he was cussing me. You'd feel it from your inside. I, I promise I you. <laughs> All right now. I promise. Mind your manners. I promise. If, uh, if he were doing it, you'd feel it in your soul. Um, <laughs> in our, I will have to wash your mouth. I mean, pff, yeah, good luck. Um, <laughs> in October of the same year, and it just says October. The whole month. The whole month. Robert, which that's actually a long time to stand in this one place. So who knows? Robert Cornelius took the first photographic self-portrait in the United States. Cool. And I put, is this technically the first selfie? I mean. It's first photographic self-portrait. Self I mean, I, I would say so. I would think so. He just didn't know it was called that. And stood there for an entire month to do it. I mean, All you did have to stay really still then. That's a long time to say that still. I mean, so the, I guess it that's is when it. they took the, the death portraits. You know what I'm talking about? Oh. Uh. It's like how in, um, is it Mexico where they do the, um, where they like prop the person up? It's there. It is. And, and I'm not like saying this. It is a Hispanic culture thing. And it is in South America, like North America, South America, like Central. 
and I'm not sure if it's Mexico or I'm not sure if it is another Hispanic country, but where um, it's like where they like would basically like sit them in their favorite recliner and like they would have like a cigarette in their hand or like however they were in life, they like sit them. Yeah. So very similar to the death portrait. It is um, creepy. Leah is out. Count me out. No, no, no. Look, Leah and I, we think the same on this. But we've also had a conversation (laughs) about funerals. And I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to look. It needs to be said. We're on the topic. It's not a hot take, but it needs to be said. Do not go to a funeral and look at the person and go, they look so good. They're dead. They don't look good. (laughs) I'm sorry. It drives me insane. Oh, they look so good. Oh, they do? Because I'm pretty sure they'd look better alive. But that's just me. Stop it. That's. Stop it. Again, not a hot take from my perspective, but apparently it is because I. Look, we've established People tragedy in different ways. Look, we've established that tragedy has befallen my life in many ways. So I've been to my fair share of funerals and it never fails. One, one, they look so good. No, they don't. <laughs> Two, they look peaceful because they're dead. <laughs> I'd be at peace too. I I can't with you. I I don't I don't understand it. Well, I understand people grieve in all kinds of ways, but also I don't need to see you. I don't. I already told Leah that if she goes before anybody else, it's going to be me and her husband standing beside her. And the first person <laughs> that comes up and says she looks so good, I'm going to look at him and go, "She did." <laughs> And just move on. I'm gonna be the I'm gonna be the one at the end of that receiving line, just waiting on my moment for, to go. Because you know I'm so much more ancient than her. To she go, knows that it's gonna she be did. First. And you think you think Michael's gonna outlive me? I don't know, but if he does, his his death wishes will actually um, be fulfilled instead of you. Oh, no. funnily enough, last night, <laughs> last night, this man. He says, oh, apparently there's another way that you can, you know, dispose of a body, take care of a body. I don't know what you call it. Is it a body farm? No, 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 no. Apparently it's Aquanation. And I said, stop right there. I don't want you to tell me anything else about it because that sounds terrifying. And he stopped right there. I my I might donate my body to science. I'm not sure. Ugh. Um, there's actually a book. It's right behind my laptop, right there. That's oh. called Death Saker. That's about the body farm. Um, it's fascinating to me. But anyway, I don't know how we got on that topic. Let's move but on. but do not no don't look. <laughs> but here's the one caveat. Here's the one caveat. I will I'll give this to you. Okay. Okay. If they're in an urn <laughs> and you say they look so good, I'm going to say fire. She looks fire. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> she looks hot. Stop it. Hot. Look, here's all. I'll, I'll, here's what I here, here, Here's what I want to say. She's peaceful in there, too. You know why? Because she can't talk. Closed. I mean, quiet as I'll ever be. Anyway, clo- closed casket. Starlight lilies and white roses. My boyfriend has already said that I have full permission for a Scandinavian funeral pyre. Awesome. He goes, I go, I don't really know how I would do that because it's going to be a little awkward if I like go there and I'm like, hey, I'm Anita's body. And they go, why? And I'm going to have to say, Because we're putting him on a boat and we're pushing him out in the boat. And then someone is going to take an arrow on fire and we're just going to 
up in flames. And that's how he wanted to go. I said, I don't think, I don't think they're going to let me do that. And he goes, fine. So just tell him that you need, you just need like a, a body double. And I go, oh, that sounds so much better. I need you to make an effigy of my significant other because I need to burn the effigy. There you go. That works. They're gone. It's fine. I said, I'm not real sure which one would sound worse. But he has he has said he he was like, I don't want to be buried in the ground, all this other stuff. And but we had a we had a conversation about about that. And then we had the conversation about you and your husband. And I said, I said, I already know what I'm gonna do. And he was like, <laughs> he goes, What? And I said, Well, you know, Leah, she won't let her husband have have the funeral and the the end of life that he wants. So here's my plan. I said, you're so mean. I said, he's going to outlive Leah. I do you have plans for me? Have y'all have y'all discussed this? Michael's going to be fine with it. It's fine. It's fine. I said, Leah's Leah can have her wishes. That's fine. Then. Michael is going to be a tree. I'm going to bury him beside Leah so that it can. It can grow next to her. And I said, and then (laughs) the tree roots are eventually going to get to the coffin. And then it's just like a friendly reminder of like. Name your name. I'm still here. Still here. (laughs) Still here. Stop it. Said he's so weird. I said, he's still going to be filling her up in the afterlife. Stop it. (laughs) Hey, it's better than um, that. It's better than that couple that we uh, talked that we already did an episode on that wanted to be buried together with his like hands or his head on her chest. Uh, oh yes, that was a good one. Anyways, sorry. We actually we'll talk about them again next week. Really? Yes. Interesting. It, it is okay. Sorry. Um. Wow. October Rabbit Trail. <laughs> October twentieth. Margaret Fuller was appointed as editor of a new transcendental magazine called The Dial. I just thought it was super interesting that a woman was appointed an editor mm-hmm. of of a magazine at that time. Margaret, also a fantastic name. That was my granny's name. Uh, Margaret's a good name. Nickname Peggy Mar- for Margaret. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. November 11th, the Virginia Military Institute was founded in Lexington, Virginia. November 13th, the Liberty Party convened in New York as the first U.S. anti-slavery party. I like them. Mm Mm-hmm. November 27th, the American Statistical Association was founded in Boston, Massachusetts. December. What is that? statistics that's why i was brushing over it very quickly because it's math but i want to i know what statistics are then you know what the statistical association is but statistics of what you'll look it up (laughs) december 18th the first and this is why i said what happened at the beginning is going to come back December 18th, the first celestial photograph of the moon was made in the United States in New York City by John Draper. Oh. So the end of the year was the U.S. The beginning of the year was France, but it was because of that that it happened in the U.S. So that's why I had to do the one in France to do the gotcha. one in the U.S. Um, undated events for this year, the first U.S. law... Oh, gosh, I forgot about this snarky comment. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) The first U.S. state law permitting women to own property was passed in Jackson, Mississippi. How kind. I put in parentheses, probably the only time Mississippi will be the first on any list. (gasps) But um, um. Look, if you're from Alabama and we do have quite totally a lot of understand. Alabama listeners, you totally understand because, hey, we're not 50th. We're always 49th because Mississippi's right behind us. <laughs> and so, look, hey, good, good for Mississippi. They, they got they made it. And then the other is the Episcopal High School was founded in Alexandria, Virginia, which was the first Episcopal High School in the state. We have our births in 1839, February 9th. Laura Redden Searing, she was a deaf 
poet and journalist who published her first book of poetry in 1864 under a pseudonym Howard Glendon. And Glendon, Minnesota was founded in 1872, and it was named in honor of the writer. Cool. She was an Aquarius. July 8th. I don't like that sigh. Everyone knows this name. We will cover him in a USBS episode. Don't you worry. That might be the longest episode we ever record. I'm intrigued. I have feelings. Oh, I can tell. If you could see how high her eyebrows were, are, something like that. John D. Rockefeller. Oh. For those who are not aware, he is an oil industry business magnet and philanthropist. He is considered the wealthiest American of all time and the richest person in modern history. He lived until he was 97, mysteriously. <clears throat> anyway. I- I'm sorry, what? Was he, that all mysterious? He had... Look, when my boyfriend comes, I'll get him on the rant. Oh, I'll get no, you, another YouTube thing. No, no, I'm it's sorry. not. A, it's not a YouTube thing. This is actual, like... He had, like, multiple open heart surgeries and heart replacements mm. in his home. Hmm. Weirdly enough, all of his donors were like Olympic athletes. Hmm. Weird. And he's the wealthiest man in American history. Anyways, I'm just saying. He's a cancer, <laughs> and I put in parentheses oddly. Don't know if I want to claim. He's a July cancer, so that's different than a June cancer. So anyways, that's what I'm going <laughs> with. Um... He's he's interesting. There's and I talked about it in the episode where we we talked about the first bank robbery in the United States. We briefly touched on John D. Rockefeller and the Rockefellers. If you're wondering, is it that Rockefeller? Yes, as I just said, wealthiest family in history, pretty much. Um, other than probably, I don't know, the Queen. But um But that's not the Queen's money, it's the country's money. Don't don't get me started. Okay, continue. Um I'm just saying, it's owned by the crown. Who wears the crown? Who? Who wears it? I wear it at my Anyways, house. we all know that. Um, but he's also a big reason of why the pharmaceutical industry kind of pushed in the way that it did of like pharmaceuticals being extremely expensive and for the pharmaceutical industry to be pushed over holistic medicine um, because they realized it was making them money. Uh, there's a whole lot that goes to it that that he's an interesting individual. So, uh, yeah, eventually he'll be a USBS episode. Not sure when, but don't worry. We will discuss. Just you wait. Yep. September 2nd, Henry George was born. He's a writer, politician, and political economist. He inspired the economic philosophy known as Georgism which was the belief that people should own the value they produce themselves, but that the value derived from land should belong equally to all members of society and that a single tax on land would create a more productive and just society. He's that makes a my head hurt. I know. He's a Virgo. And December 12th, Caroline Lake. Quinner was born. You may know her as Caroline Ingalls. She is an American pioneer and the mother of Laura Ingalls Wilder. I do know that. She is a Sagittarius. We know a lot of Sagittariuses, which is very interesting. Would that be a Sagittarii or a group? Sagittarii, probably. Um, they're a stubborn eye. I can tell you that. Um, I can say that I've, I've had one. Um, <laughs> so, geez. Whew. Um, our deaths in 1839, February 26th, we have Sib. Nope. Yep. No. <laughs> Sybil Ludington. 
And honestly, honestly, a movie needs to be made about her. Ooh. Trademark if it hasn't been done. If you do it, I will see you. Can you um, just call trademark? Is it like shotgun? It's what we're doing. That's what we're doing now. <laughs> uh, she is a heroine of the American Revolutionary War. Ooh. She was the daughter of a colonel in the colonial militia, Henry Ludington. When she was six years... Nope. That would have been amazing. When she was 16, not six, uh, she made an all-night horseback ride to alert militia forces in the neighboring towns of what is today's Putnam County. Um, and she was coming to warn them of the burning of Danbury, Connecticut by British forces. Ooh. And she actually saved an entire group of militia men by Ooh. riding through the night to warn them. Pretty much, she's she is the sixteen year old Paul Revere. Cool. So that you know, she she is she is that. Um, she's just very interesting. You're gonna like this name, April second. Hezekiah. Ooh, I do like it. Nils. He's an American editor and publisher of the Baltimore-based National Weekly News Magazine, the Nils Weekly Register, and the Weekly Register. I wonder if they called him Hez, like people that, like his, his friends Hez or his family. Yeah, I don't know. I It's, back then I don't feel like nicknames were a thing. You know what oh, I mean? come on. Anyways, May 11th, Thomas Cooper died. He was an Anglo-American economist uh, and the... He was a college president and a political philosopher. He was described by Thomas Jefferson as one of the ablest men in America, by John Adams as a learned, ingenious, scientific, and talented madcap. And Dumas Malone stated that modern scientific progress would have been impossible without the freedom of mind which he championed throughout life. I mean, he hung out with some pretty, pretty, pretty important people. All I can say is when I look at the name Dumas, that's not what I think. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we revert back to our 12-year-old selves. I live there. Um, <laughs> December 4th, John Leamy. He was an Irish-born American merchant who pioneered Philadelphia's trade with the Spanish colonies in the Americas. He was a founder of the Insurance Company of North America and the Hibernian Society. And the Hibernian Society, which we discussed it before, and I think you said, what is that? Um, it's not about bears hibernating. Um, Man. It is an Irish Catholic fraternal organization, and the members must be male, Catholic, and they have to be born in Ireland or they have to be of direct Irish descent. Man, I'm counting out on all three. All three. Me too. <sighs> I know. I mean, so all three. To our case for this week, January 12th of 1839, Edward Coleman, the leader of the 40 Thieves gang, was hanged at Tombs Prison after being convicted of brutally beating his wife, Anne. I thought Alibaba had the 40 Thieves. We are digging into one of my favorite topics this week. <laughs> there are a few niches of crime that I find absolutely fascinating. And I have mentioned this one in a couple of episodes before, specifically. Organized crime. The mob. Gangs. If the first thing that comes to mind is the book-turned-movie called The Gangs of New York, then you are on the right track. That's what I said. The subject of this week's episode is actually the first criminal named in Herbert Asbury's book. But they also claim a few titles, such as the oldest criminal gang in New York City and the first Irish gang with an established leader. Mm. I've discussed it before. I was in the mob in a past life. I have to be. I have to be. Either that or I was married in. I'm just saying. I <laughs> I have I look. Look. I'm just saying. The words we're going to take a long walk off show up here and you in some cement shoes. It, it's come out of my mouth before. <laughs> mhm. Mm 
We're going to take <laughs> a long walk off a short pier, you and some cement shoes, and we're going to see how you feel about it then, eh? <laughs> hmm? It's pretty good. Hmm? We're going to see how you feel. <laughs> then you sleep with the fishes. <laughs> Just saying. It's pretty good. I, there's something about it. You just gotta love it. Gotta, you gotta love Al Pacino too. Anyways, um, I've grown a new respect for Al Pacino in the past few weeks. Um, <laughs> not that I didn't know who he was. Chill out, people. I've seen Indiana Jones now, and I don't know who Al Pacino is, so chill out. Uh, we, we've just, for some weird reason, been on an Al Pacino movie Please kick. make the distinction that you know that Al Pacino is not Indiana Jones because some people are going to come Oh, no, about that. correct. Yes, I okay. know that's Harrison Ford. Okay, because um, you, you said that sentence, and no, no, I no. know you know, but some no, people... Yes. No, no, no. I'm aware okay. that's Harrison Ford. Um, I have seen all three Indiana Jones movies, and if you tell my boyfriend there are four, he will say you are wrong because the fourth one is garbage. So I have not seen the fourth one. It really is not worth watching. So it was a disappointment. It's there um, were some funny lines, but it's not. Yeah, Indiana I, I, Jones. I, I, um, but we just watched an Al Pacino movie night before last. We watched The Heat. Well, we technically finished The Heat. We had watched started it like seriously six months ago and we had like 30 minutes of it left <laughs> that may be so long it's three hours long i don't think i've watched it it's a long one um and and we're watching it and i and i just look at it and i went hmm so al pacino is the good guy in this one interesting not what i expected because <laughs> you know he's always like in the mob or he's right. scarface or he's like you know, and in this one, he's a cop. And I was like, huh. I don't know how I like it. That's a turn. I don't think I like it. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. No, that's a turn. We watched. Is it Donnie Brasco? It's a movie with Johnny Depp and Al Pacino. Yes. I haven't really, I'm tell you the truth, I've really not watched a lot of his movies. <sighs> Sorry. Anyways. That's, that's, that's not my genre. I'm just saying. Um, I find the mob fascinating. Also, side note that does relate. If you are on Wikipedia and you are looking into gangs and mobs and things of the such, at the bottom, there is a list of mobs and gangs. And they're, they're split up by ethnicity, whether they're Italian-American all those sorts of things. Interesting. Of course, we have the five families, which everybody should know who the five families are. You've got the Lucases, you've got the Gambinos, you got like that's the mob, like the crime family. They're Leah's looking at me like she has no idea. Anyways, no, no, I do, I do know that there are families, I don't but know it's who called. They are, but yes, it's called the five families. Like those are the five families around everything. <laughs> so you'll see all these sections, and it's like active in a list, inactive, and I'm like. Does that mean hmm. deceased or incarcerated? No, just not not running anymore. I gotcha. And so, but I'm like, hmm. So y'all are just going to put active lists of mobs. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, all right. <laughs> there you go. Don't think that's whatever. Yeah. So that's, the area. That's pretty bold. Yeah. The area that we are in for this episode is called Five Points. It was a neighborhood located in lower Manhattan and for anyone who knows about Manhattan, the northeastern and eastern portion of what was Five Points is now encompassed with, like, Chinatown and where the Civic Center is. Um, this area was extremely populated, dangerously so, and it was described as disease-ridden, crime-infested slums. Lovely. And it was a part of NYC culture for over 70 years. Mm. Seven zero. Anyway. That's just a couple years. There used to be a 48-acre pond in the middle of the area called Collect Pond, which was the main source of drinking water for earlier European settlements. If you think way back to episode one, we talked about Lisbonid Meadows. That was where the well was. That's where the whole, like, everything took place in Lisbon. This area. Was there an article of clothing found near that well? I don't know, Leah. Was there? I think maybe. What was it? Hmm? I think it was something to warm your hands with. 
We're going to need to be more specific. I think it was a muff. Mm. Mm. Beaver muff? <laughs> Perhaps. Bipedal tail is beaver muff. That was it? Got it. Just making sure we're on the same page. Okay. So anyways, <laughs> <laughs> when this pond was eventually filled in, um, it Lisbonid Meadows was kind of on where this this area was. It kind of like fed into it. Anyways. Gotcha. It's very confusing because when you look at a map back then, you it is literally like a massive pond just like dropped in the middle of the city huh. that's just gone. Like oh, and now it's just gone. Right yeah. We'll find out why. And it's not great. Uh oh. <laughs> um, so at the beginning of the 1700s, businesses started forming around uh, the pond in order to use the water. But the contaminated wastewater of the businesses around the pond flowed back into the pond oh. and it created a major pollution problem and made the pond an environmental health hazard. By 1811, the pond was filled in and homes were built on top of it. This didn't work because the landfill was not engineered properly. Uh Oh. And the buried vegetation began to release methane gas. Oh, no. The un- stinky. Oh, it's bad. The unstable ground caused foundations of homes to shift, and the unpaved streets were mostly buried in mud and excrement. Oh. We'll just say all kinds of excrement. The middle and upper class abandoned the area by the early 1820s and poor immigrants flooded into the area. The numbers soared in the 1840s when many Irish Catholics fled during the famine. At the height of occupation of five points, only certain areas of London's east end vied with it. Uh, And if y'all know anything about the east end in London at this time... That's how bad we're talking. Yuck. Yeah. Um, it's, they had a lot of things in common. The massive population density, disease, the infant and child mortality rates, uh, unemployment, sex work, violent crime, and other classic ills of the urban destitute. Charles Dickens once visited the area wanting to see five points for himself. His description of the scene appeared in his book, American Notes. He said, quote, All that is loathsome, drooping, and decaying is here. Some considered Five Points the origin of the American melting pot, though, and it consisted primarily of freed slaves and Irish. Whether they were Irish Americans or Irish immigrants, it was kind of both. There were tensions between the two communities, but it is the first large-scale instance of racial integration in american history Hmm. it was forced it was well it was it was but it was the first time that it was truly like there was really like it was Mm -hmm. it was there um so i thought that was all interesting but think about it it's because it was the two Mm mm-hmm the the two um people oh remember we talked were, about the fight that i think was in chicago or it was in a previous episode where we talked where it was freed slaves and irish catholics started fighting against each other for mm-hmm. work yeah um and we didn't cover it because it was it was yeah. a lot but I mean, but yeah the two classes that yeah that were cast out and they do talk about it i don't think that i put it in here eventually what ended up happening is that the freed uh slave community eventually migrated to what is now Harlem. Uh um, And that's kind of how they ended up separating from one another. So um, anyways, Five Points is alleged to have had the highest murder rate of any slum at that time in the world. Oh, my. According to an old New York urban legend, the old brewery that was in the area, formerly Coulthard's Brewery, from the 1970s, uh, which was an overcrowded tenement on Cross Street, which housed about a thousand people, oh, is said to have had a murder a night for <gasps> 15 years. Oh my gosh! Until its demolition in 1852. Oh my goodness! This area is also home of other famous mobsters. 
such as Paul Kelly, the founder of the Five Points Gang, Johnny Torino, Al Capone, Lucky Luciano, and John Morrissey, leader of the Dead Rabbits Gang. The Dead Rabbits. The 40 Thieves is who we are going to focus on, and they were actually allies with the Dead Rabbits, and we actually have an episode on the Dead Rabbits later. We're getting into mob times, so we we have a few episodes coming up that we are going to discuss the mob. We're going to discuss different portions of gangs, different crimes that, that align with that. You'll kind of notice when we start to go through history, you'll kind of notice where we are because we're all of a sudden getting into mobs, but then we're going to take like a real sharp left hand turn and go to like <laughs> Western crimes where yeah. we're going to get into like the Jesse James and we're going to get into Doc Holiday and all of that kind of stuff. So you, you're, you're it's interesting. You it's interesting to see kind of where we are in history and like what crimes are the biggest at that time. It's it's just, yeah. So right now, and it's inter- interesting to see what's happening at the same mm-hmm. time, but where it's happening, exactly. like you may not realize what's happening at the same time, mm-hmm. but it's just in different places and how different things are yeah. in different places. So it's rumored that the 40 Thieves took their names from Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, which is a folk tale from 1001 Nights, which is a collection of Middle Eastern folk tales. The group formed in 1825, and as I said before, it is allegedly Allegedly. the first known and oldest criminal street gang in New York City. The gang was primarily made up of Irish and Irish Americans, and Irish, specifically Irish immigrants, Mm -hmm. not Irish American. Um, Their presence was a menace of five points, and they terrorized the neighborhood itself. However, do not get this gang confused with the 40 thieves that formed in London in 1828. They are not affiliated. Oh. They are also certainly not affiliated with the all-female London gang called the 40 Elephants, but also used the name the 40 Thieves. I would not call myself an elephant. They operated from 1873 to 1950. There was also a criminal gang in Philadelphia later that used the same name. Um, and another gang made themselves known in the same year I put as the OG 40 Thieves. <laughs> and they are the Carrionians. They were also a primarily Irish group whose name comes from County Kerry, Ireland. Okay. And they are allegedly, allegedly, <laughs> the second oldest criminal gang in New York City. And the 40 Thieves beat out the Carrionians like... By just a few months okay. as far as like who's the first um and trust me if you look up the carrionians real bitter that they were not the first oh. um <laughs> but they were allies with the 40 thieves so there's that edward and coleman the head of the 40 thieves originally based the gang in new york's lower east side The gang's main purpose was to rebel against their social status but the members soon turned to crime to better their situation They met at a grocery store on Center Street, which was owned by Rosanna Piers. This was an interesting grocery store. This is an excerpt from Herbert Asbury's book, The Gangs of New York, Section 1 of Chapter 2. Quote, The first of these speakeasies was established about 1825 by Rosanna Piers in Center Street, just south of Anthony, now Worth Street. Piles of decaying vegetables were displayed on racks outside the store, but Rosanna provided a back room in which she sold the fiery liquor of the period at lower prices than it could be obtained in the recognized saloons. This room soon became the haunts of, this is a direct quote, it's not a word people use anymore, thugs, pickpockets, murderers, and thieves. The gang known as the 40 Thieves, which appears to have been the first in New York, with a definite acknowledged leadership, is said to have been found in Rosanna Pierce's grocery store, and her back room was used as its meeting place, and is headquartered by Edward Coleman and other eminent chieftains. There they received the reports of their henchmen, and from its dimly lit corners dispatched the gangsters on their warlike missions. On their warlike missions. Here's the other question. 
And my Roseanne appears in the last life. <laughs> <laughs> Look, she runs like a, a back, a, a speakeasy, selling selling liquor at low rates. She's not encouraging gang activity, but she's not condoning it. The girl's trying to make some coin. <laughs> I'm just saying. Don't try to put a businesswoman down. I mean, she needed support too. Anyways, there were quotas that the gang had to meet, and they included a rather strict system where members had to bring back a certain amount of stolen goods or be thrown out. The system made it very competitive among the members because veterans were competing against younger members for the higher positions. Five points desperately lacked the aid of government support, due to the high crime rate and violence. Um, And the 40 Thieves saw this as an economic opportunity as they established relations with Tammany Hall. Now, Tammany Hall is very confusing. It's, yes, a building, yes, a group. It is a government group, but also put into the category of gangs. That's a whole lot. So, yeah. Um, Tammany Hall was a corrupt bureaucracy which provided community services in exchange for money and support from its residents to fund their corrupt agendas. Um, Then there was the juvenile 40 little thieves. Oh, no. Which I love, honestly. They were an apprentice street gang of the original 40 thieves, and they ended up outlasting their mentors. (gasps) They continued to commit illegal activities throughout the 1850s before eventually joining the later street gangs following the American Civil War in 1865. The 40 Thieves were not able to sustain themselves long term, though, and by 1850, the gang had dissolved and members went into other gangs or got out completely. I put whether that was in a body bag or not is unknown. I mean, probably not in a body bag, probably just, you They know. were just thrown in. I was going to say they were thrown into the sin, but we're not in London. So, mm. the Hudson. The Hudson. Um, <laughs> the demise of the 40 Thieves could likely be due to the death of their leader, Edward Coleman, in 1839. There isn't much known about Edward's early life from what I can find. We do know that he was the head of one of the first gangs in New York City and that he was the first Irish established leader. However, it isn't his crimes related to the gang that sentenced him to death. Right, right. Edward had been involved in the 40 Thieves for about 15 years before meeting and marrying a hot corn girl named Anne in 1838. You're not saying that she was hot, like she sold corn that was hot. Hot corn girls were often Irish-American immigrants or freed women who sold ears of hot corn on the streets, which was the street food of choice in New York at this time. I'm so perceptive. But I bet she was cute. She has another nickname. What is it? We'll get there. Um, (laughs) They are kind of like the first street vendors. Um, Although the name seems sensual in nature, um, it does not derive from anything of that sort. Uh, A lot of people did say that they did, and there could have been some of that going on. Yeah. Um, uh, There was a book by Solon Robinson called Hot Corn Life Scenes in New York from 1854, Um, and that's who kind of described the entire hot corn girl scene as Mm -hmm. to what it was. Um, There is debate on this, like I said, though. The other theory is that hot corn girls uh, doubled as murderous sex workers. Oh, no. Who drew Johns in with their seeming innocence. (gasps) And for anybody who doesn't know what a John is, like, you should know what a John is. But that's someone coming for services. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, John Doe, John Smith. Gotcha. Johns. Yeah. Um, So, Anne was not Irish, and she is described as mixed race and from Haiti. They called her another word. Uh Uh-huh. I don't know if... If it is acceptable. 
I don't think it's negative Mm -hmm. as bad as some other words are. Right. But I don't know how accepted it is. Right. Does that make sense? I do. Um, I mean, it does. I understand what you're saying. It's a word that starts with an M. Mm -hmm. I'll go as far as to say that for people who are not aware because I hate to like. You don't want to say it. I I don't. Yeah, I don't know because I personally would not think that would be something that someone would want to be In literature that I have read and in period pieces that I have seen. It um, seems like a word at that time. But it is derogatory. But it is derogatory. Yes, especially in New Orleans. It was very derogatory. So I I, I think you're good to not say it yeah i i don't um but that that was how she was described so it said that she is haitian but that she she was mixed um which i gotta say this i'm sure she was beautiful i was just about to say mixed children oh my god they're gorgeous Mm -hmm. i mean children are gorgeous sometimes in general but i mean i'm just gonna say all children are not because I, that's I, true i worked i worked at daycare and sometimes people would come in for a tour and and they would have their sweet precious baby and and all children are precious <laughs> and so they would have their sweet new little <laughs> offspring and i would say oh how precious because you can't always say oh how beautiful because it's not it's always not always true, true. but sometimes they look like a shriveled little rat that's true i will say though um i have some friends that are, are you do not right um that i know that have they are you know the her husband is uh black and she is white (sighs) those children (laughs) let me tell you models i mean god they are gorgeous Mm -hmm. and it's just like they're born and i'm like you even look cute after you were born (laughs) like because trust me i my daughter was very cute a few days after she was born. Right after, <laughs> not so much. Um, I mean, well, there's also it's a traumatic event. I wouldn't expect her to look great. There's but. also a thing to be said for a C-section baby and a this non-C-section baby because C-section babies, if it's a planned C-section and, mm-hmm. and they don't, you know, they enter, a rounder head. They have a rounder head. Yeah. So. Anyways, it said that she learned all kinds of things here. I know. It said that she was mixed race, and all I can think of is she must have been freaking gorgeous. Mm, I'm sure. Um, because her nickname was the pretty hot corn girl. And there you go. Specifically, the pretty one. She was the hot, hot. She was the hot, hot, hot corn girl. Uh Um. Smoking hot corn girl. Smoking hot. (laughs) Uh, There is also speculation that Edward was actually black and he was not of Irish descent at all. I could only. Yeah, I don't. I don't understand Um, because of of everything that I've read. But I had to put it in there because a lot of sources do say that, that that's a big possibility. I don't think it's accurate, but. I had to put it in there just because it is what it is. This is another quote from section two of chapter one of the gangs of New York, where they describe the relationship between Edward and Anne quote, the hot corn girl became one of the most romantic figures of the five points and her favors were eagerly sought out by the young bloods of the district who fought duels over her and celebrated her beauty and sparkling wit in song and story. Mm. The earnings of the best looking girls were considerable and it soon became the custom for a five points hero with a loathing for labor to send his young and handsome wife into the street each night carrying a cedar bucket filled with roasting ears while he cruised along in her wake and hurled brick bats at the young men who dared flirt with her. The first hanging in the tombs grew out of such a situation. Edward Coleman was one of the original gangsters of Paradise Square and became enamored of a young woman known throughout the five points as the pretty hot corn girl. He married her after fierce fights with dozens of protesting suitors. Dozens. Dozens. Girl was getting it. (laughs) Just saying. Kayla. She was. Look. 
Mary Rogers was too. I'm just saying. Look, look, just saying. D- these women get it, girl. Girls got to eat. Just saying. Um, Mm-mm-mm. but yes, dozens of protesting suitors. So this is a fight. There is little information on what happened next. While the story of Anne is widely known due to Asbury's book and in gang history in general, the exact story isn't fully known, which in a sense might not be a bad thing. After Edward and Anne married, Anne was still working as a hot corn girl. As her husband, Edward was entitled to her earnings. However... When she did not earn as much as expected, trigger warning, guys, if you want to just skip forward, Edward beat her to death. Recent theories suggest that he slashed her throat, almost decapitating her. Oh, my. But the widely known story is that he beat her to death. She was found alive, but then then later died of her injuries. Okay. Hold up. They hadn't even been married a year. Um, so <laughs> she working, she working girl. She making her own money. Just wait till you hear what the papers said. You want to know what they said first? No. You, okay. Okay. Because. You get mad again after that. It's fine. She was making her own money. Mm-hmm. It was all going, going fine. And then she gets married and she's got to give her money over to him. Because they were married. Yes. Uh-uh. That's how things went during this time. Don't you know that? Well, I do, but it still makes me angry. Um, I mean, I'm just saying, I would expect that, you know, during this time, the husband was, you, it, it, you didn't have to work after you got married because Not her. I'm just saying, so who <laughs> on him? The papers said jealousy and infidelity were the motive for the murder rather than anything financial. Quoting Edward himself saying that he killed her, quote, because she slept with another man. Mm. It was not his fault, obviously. (gasps) I mean, he killed her, so... (sighs) Edward was quickly arrested and convicted of murder. The Christian Advocate and Journal reprinted a full transcript of the address given by the judge when Edward was sentenced to death. This is a portion of what the judge said, quote, Upon this solemn occasion, it is unusual, though it can hardly be necessary, to admonish you of the importance of preparing yourself to meet your creator. Circumstance as you are with your days, empathetically few and numbered, with this world and all its allurements, Receding from your view and the prospect of another opening upon you, it is not in human nature to be insensible to the importance of preparing to meet your creator. To him, therefore, let your most fervent supplication be raised, for he will soon be your all. You will have none left but him. Mm. Edward was taken to the newly constructed Tombs Prison in Five Points. The Tombs' formal title was the New York Halls of Justice and House of Detention, as it housed the city's courts, police, and detention facilities. It was a notable example of Egyptian revival architecture, although opinion varied greatly concerning that validity. Uh, Charles Dickens, he's back again, he described it as, or he said not, quote, What is this dismal fronted pile of, (laughs) sorry, guys, I got to say it, I got to say a bad word, Uh, but you know, it makes me a little happy. What is this dismal fronted pile of bastard Egyptian, like an enchanter's palace in a melodrama? Dang. I mean. Okay, fine. Thanks, Chuck. (laughs) I mean seems a little haughty, to be honest. Um, The prison was well known for its corruption and was the scene of numerous scandals and escapes during its early history. A fire destroyed part of the building on November 18th of 1842, the same day that a notorious killer was due to be hanged. Dun, dun, dun. We are covering him in a few episodes. Cool. Would you like to know who he is? (gasps) Yes, I would. John C. Colt. Ah. Yes, of those Colts. Yes. So, 
Interesting. Also convicted murder and New York City politician William J. Sharkey. That's a fun name. I love it. Uh, he earned national notoriety for escaping from the prison on November 22nd, 1872. Disguised as a woman. Must have been an ugly woman. There you go. He was never captured and his fate is unknown. But as to Edward Coleman, we do know. on January 12th of 1839, Edward Coleman sealed his fate and became the first man hanged in the tombs prison. Mm. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. Mm. He, I mean, he obviously not was not it. remorseful. Not mad about it. He was it. not remorseful. So. He, I mean, he just said, yeah, I did it. <laughs> and? So that is our first dip into gang culture in the United States at this time. Like I said, we will be coming back. Um, and this is an interesting one because even though we were in New York City and we were in Manhattan, we got to talk about a specific area that we did not, we haven't been in before. So while it is a uh, less... kind of angry. I know. Well, sorry. I, I guess that's what this podcast is for. Um Making me angry. To make you angry. Um, it does make me angry. I mean, <laughs> so what? But, again, we do have a USBS episode that just came out. You will find it all interesting. Um, I will say that it is the first of something that other people thought the first was something else. <laughs> if that's vague enough for you. Um, I can say that it is Who's widely, first? <laughs> it, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> I can say that it is widely thought that there is one thing that was the first in the United States and it was not. So it's an interesting tale and I hope that y'all enjoy it for our Patreon members. Um, we have a website where you can find any and all ONUC information you are looking for. It is one nation under crime.com. We are one nation under crime on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and at ONUC pod on Twitter. If you love our podcast as much as we do, please follow us and recommend us to everyone, you know, and see if you yes. feel like it. I mean, you should feel like it because if you love us, you want other people to know about us so you can share the love. And go leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Yes, you should. As I said before, we do have a Patreon and USBS episodes are coming out there. Um, if you would like to also be a cool Patreon subscriber, there are a few tiers that you can join and you can decide whether you would like to be a patriot, a founding father, an ONUC loyalist, whatever you prefer. Go ahead. Go join. Have fun. Be a cool kid. Um, and we thank you guys for listening to this week's episode Very of much. One Nation Under Crime. We will see you here. Same time. Different crime. Next week. And remember, there isn't always liberty and justice for all, especially if you run a street gang and you marry him. Yeah, unfortunately. Goodbye. <laughs>